Well, <clears throat> Marina, thank you for the invitation, uh, John, who delivered it um, and reminded me of the need to respond. Um, and um, can I just say in reference to your comment earlier about is there a doctor in the house, just for the record I'm not, uh, so if anyone carks it, uh, don't come to me. Um, uh, Although I'd have to say that confusion that developed over a 30-year period was quite useful for inadvertent hotel upgrades. Um, I'd also, in in just acknowledging a lot, particular line in one of the opening presentations, I feel very proud and honoured now to be part of a generation that's over 22 years of age. Um, what I want to focus on is more on systems, which is going to be quite boring compared with um, what you've been... Uh, you know, the presenta earlier presentations. Um, but essentially, uh, public health systems, uh, and that, that is my focus, is the, uh, it really is the most effective way of delivering a universal health care that's accessible, uh, comprehensive. Uh, and that's uh, through funding, especially. Funding is more important in terms of avoiding fragmentation, but also provision as much as practical. Um, the other point I really stands out for me too is that structural change by itself, structural change does not drive systems improvement. And that's relevant to some of the stuff I want to mention later on. Uh, process change will, more, is more likely to do it when it's through engagement. Um, and the way to approach our system, there are broadly speaking two ways of approaching it. One is through a very structural lens and the other is through relational. Uh, and the relational one, in my view, trumps it all the time. And the reason for that, um, well, part of the reason, reason for that, is that the um, health, health care, especially in a public hospital setting, but health care is labour intensive. Um, and what drives systems improvement is really a combination of workforce plus technology and engagement. That drives the effect of changes that are sustainable. Uh, those changes that are driven by other means through more structural approaches are less likely to. Now, the workforce and the system is actually, there's some enormous intellectual capital there. And it's not just the specialists, it's not just the nurses, it's not just the scientists and technicians and allied health professionals. I previously was in the education sector over 30 years ago, um, and when I moved to the health sector, I thought I'd see a lot of similarity, and there certainly are in terms of values and professionalism, uh, but in terms of complexity, of occupational complexity, especially when you get into a hospital setting, but even in community care, is enormous and, and, and can be not fully appreciated. And in fact, in, we talk about the, when we talk about improving quality, uh, infection rates in theatres, as I understand it, I'm not familiar with the data, but from what people who are tell me, is that infection rates in operating theatres decline when those hospitals employ their own cleaning staff to do it. Uh, there is a connection so that the quality improvement is not just at the professional, the health professional level, but it's through the entirety of the workforce. Uh, and essentially it comes down to the, to the point that those, and you can apply this to the economy as a whole, those who do the job are those most likely to know how best to improvement if to improve it and improve the systems. Now, it seems to me that the critical issues facing the health sector from a systems point of view, um, um, are, well, these are not the only critical issues, but the ones that I want to sort of briefly refer to, as the predominance of a culture of managerialism and Phil Bagshaw, uh, um, who I invariably agree with, and occasionally not, but uh, overwhelmingly do, uh, is something that... Um, it's quite pervasive in the sector. Uh, we have a lack of what I would call distributed or distributive clinical leadership. Um, and by that I mean not simply having formal leaders, formal positions of uh, leadership, they're important, but actually having as part of the workforce as a whole a part of their job and using their expertise to actually shape the way in which our systems are delivered. Um, <clears throat> Because no, no health service can remain in isolation. Today, yesterday, today's, um, um, today's silo was yesterday's innovation. And, um, 
and, and, but that uh, innovation in the past, that silo, at one point was something that was an innovation, but changes has to be ongoing because health services are ongoing. We have an overall leadership uh, capacity. I exclude the former uh, Chief Executive of West Coast District Health Board, who happens to be in the audience from that, that characterisation, um, and any others just to, who might be here just to protect my back. Um, but we do overall, I think, suffer from a strategic leadership capability issue in our district health boards and, and beyond. And we do obviously have uh, underfunding. I don't want to speak much about underfunding, despite that rather busy slide, but I just want to make the point that the, um, <clears throat> in the budget, it talked about, it actually proposed, when you look at the budget estimates, a 9.2% increase to the funding that goes into district health boards. Now, that's significant. And when I, thought, when I saw that, I thought, oh, great, excellent, a breakthrough. Uh, but when you actually look more closely, not at the vote estimates itself, but the deficit side of things, it changes. Uh, the, the last estimate around, and it's in the Simpson report, is that, uh, which is ministry sourced, uh, is that for the last financial year that ended 30 June, the deficits for DHPs are estimated to be nearly uh, um, 559 million. So when you take that into account, it does suggest that the actual real increase is 5.1% at best. Now that still sounds a lot, but there are drivers on the other side. Health is not something that you can actually turn off a tap uh, because people still come through the door needing help on, on the acute side of things at least. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of unmet need, but they're also increasing acute admissions. And these are unstoppable. Uh, increasing acute admissions and chronic illness treatment, population, the ageing of the population as well as the growing of the population. Ageing of population brings more comorbidities and frailty, and they're also prevalent... Um, um, uh, poverty-related illnesses as well on the up. All those things increase the cost of providing health care over and above. We could actually do get a better return from the health dollar if we actually didn't have a culture of managerialism, we had a more distributed leadership system in the, in the system. Commenting on the review of the health and disability system, there's a lot that can be said on this, uh, and I can't do that now. Um, I am blogging on it a little bit, um, uh, but even that, you need more space. Uh, but part of the health, what the Simpson Review recommends is massive restructuring. It's called about reducing DHBs, but there's a lot that actually sits behind that. We would go to either 8 to um, 12 district health wards down from 20. What that means is that district health boards, it's best to see them not as less district health boards, but mega district health boards. Uh, and depending on whether they go to eight, in which case most likely you're talking about three in Auckland, one in Hamilton, one in either Palmerston North Hawke's Bay, one in Wellington, one Christchurch, and one Dunedin. Probably that's where it might fall. There might be some variations of that within that number. Which means that places like the district health boards in Northland, Bay of Plenty, uh, Hawke's Bay or Mid-Central, Nelson Marlborough, all those are quite sizeable district health boards by New Zealand standards would go and they would be managed by these mega organisations, let alone the smaller DHBs such as West Coast and Taranaki and others. And that over a period would occur over a period of five years, which means that we would have five years of uncertainty over the future of services, distraction, destabilisation of the workforce and disruption. And how can you introduce process improvement when you've got that going on? How can you actually recruit to fill vacancies with the ageing of the workforce, particularly when you depend on international recruitment, with that going on? There's a new natural, uh, national bureaucracy to be created uh, called Health New Zealand, a centralised organisation uh, that would sit up there equal to the Ministry of Health. The Ministry would focus on policy, uh, and uh, Health New Zealand would focus on uh, the provision of, uh, of community, so primary care and hospital services. Uh, so much more centralised, uh, and this body would govern and direct the district health boards. There will be a serious risk, as we experienced in the late 90s, with the Health Funding Authority and the Ministry of Health of competition between, on policy between the two, because even if the Ministry is handling policy, Health, Work for, uh, Health New Zealand will still require a policy brain of some sort to make its various uh, deliberative decisions. 
Um, it will require, create some accountability confusions for district health boards, these mega district health boards. Their main line of accountability will be to Health New Zealand, but it will also include to the Ministry. So there, there are concerns there. Uh, this was actually proposed initially in a report known as the Murray Horn Report um, to uh, the, the incoming national government a few years ago, uh, and that proposed a national health board um, that would sit in, uh, opposite to the um, Ministry of Health, but its functions, there was a back down, the functions were brought within, back into the Ministry. <clears throat> now, there's some things in the Sim Simpson report that are actually quite interesting and have some good uh, processed attraction, um, and it's focused on community and primary care. Um, so, uh, that which they call Tier 1, not a title I particularly like, but it's there, and that's the entry point to the health system for, me, for most. Um, and what the Simpson report does quite correctly is say that that's the most effective way of actually increasing health and, uh, and well-being. And it focuses on stretching the capacity and capability of Tier 1 through commissioning, but I want to just want to mention locality planning. Localities, perhaps iwi, iwi boundaries, or perhaps council barrier, uh, boundaries, or natural boundaries, would be a basis of developing locality planning on the services to be provided. I think that's uh, highly laudable. Um, so, the solutions, um, from a sort of a broader systemic uh, standpoint, in terms of what I'm focusing on, is first of all recognising the importance of the continuum, continuum between of care between community and hospital care, rather than simply between DHBs. Uh, abandon managerialism, that culture, and focus on the basis that if what makes good clinical sense will also make good financial sense. Empower the workforce clinically and beyond, strengthen leadership, uh, workforce leadership, drop the restructuring, it doesn't help, focus on uh, improving the processes and locality planning, as I've talked about, and you can reassess the structures after that, depending on what that throws up. Strengthen the capability of the health ministry for improving the processes of improving the provision of services, rather than invent a new structure to do so, and get the funding right, so that at the very least it can focus on what we need to actually operate the system and to meet the unmet need that people like Phil Bagshaw have gone through an enormous effort to identify tentatively what that might be. Thank you. My throat's dry.